Hello, I'm Locke Meredith, and I'd like to invite you to join me on the next Legal Lines. We're very pleased to have on the show our United States Congressman, Bill Cassidy. Bill is a medical doctor, his wife is also, and he's been on the front lines for over 20 years of taking care of folks, the uninsured, and he's going to talk to us about the health care bill, uh, the various options that are available, and what is his answer to the problem that we have with health care. So join us on the next Legal Lines with Dr. Bill Cassidy, the United States Congressman for the state of Louisiana. Cox Digital Cable gives you a ton of programming choices. But did you know we're making them easier to find? Soon, our new advanced interactive programming guide will make it simple with a whole new look for easier navigation. Even on demand gets a facelift, so finding your favorite show won't be a mystery, even if that show is a mystery. Get ready to sit back, pick a channel, and get more out of what you're into with Cox Digital Cable. Hello, I'm Locke Meredith, and I'm very pleased to have on the show today Dr. Bill Cassidy. Uh, Dr. Cassidy is a United States Congressman for District 6. Bill, thank you so much for coming on the show. And thank you for having me. I know it's been crazy. You've been up there, we were talking before, uh, what, about se seven months now? Yes. And uh, you got there, and of course, we had the crash of the economy and the stimulus package. We got the war cranking. And then, of course, we've got this uh, health care plan. Mm -hmm. uh, and cap and trade, don't forget that. That's right, which yeah. seems to me kind of the... A big tax, but we'll talk about that. Yes. Let's dive in though to health care because it's everywhere. You know, the town halls and it seems a lot, a lot of head button, but let's do this just, uh, you know, in a reasonable, thoughtful, logical way. What is the problem with our current system? You know, you hear a lot of folks saying there's just not even any problem. I don't agree with that. What are I your thoughts? And, and I agree with you. There is a problem. Uh, the goal of any reform, and that tells you what the problem is now, is to have access to high quality health care at an affordable cost. So there's some that don't have access and there's some that can't afford it. As a rule, if you have access, you have pretty high quality care, but there may be some improvements there as well. So the question is, how do you achieve access to high quality care at an affordable cost? And there's something uh, called the three imperatives of health care reform. The three things you got to do to fix the system. And I mention them because it tells you what's wrong. You've got to address health care problems. We've got too many folks who are smoking and too many folks who are too heavy because both of those things drive up cost and worsen that person's health. Secondly, okay. we have too high administrative cost. The family practitioner, 40% of her overhead is related to billing insurance companies. So paperwork. Paperwork. Now, Pushing they're paperwork. not doing anything with the patient. That's 40%. Now that's so 60% productivity in essence. Exactly. And so um, that's a potential area of savings. And as we go forward, you have to look at any solution as to whether it increases administrative cost or decreases administrative cost. And the last thing is transparency. I'm a gastroenterologist. I tell folks it prepares me for Washington, D.C. Uh, <laughs> but, but that said, if, if you came to me for a colonoscopy, there's no place you could go to on the Internet to compare my price of a colonoscopy right. versus someone else. That's the only area of our economy that does not have transparency. Meaning no competition, no way to compare the price for the service. Exactly. So if you can fix the lack of transparency, cost, lifestyle changes, uh, driving up cost, and the high administrative cost, then you'll start providing access to high quality health care at an affordable cost. And what's so interesting, Bill, is that you've been on the front lines for 20 some odd years. I mean, you've been a doctor, you've been taking care of folks who are uninsured, uh, you were elected frankly, in my opinion, in part because you've dedicated your life to take care of folks like that. You've seen it, uh, it you've experienced it. So tell the folks, in your opinion, how do we deal with this? Well, and I've worked at Earl K. Long, and, and it's you've, been... You teach, too. I teach, too, and it's such a privilege to work with folks who are highly motivated. Uh, but nonetheless, at Earl K. Long, we suffer from lack of funding. So my concern about a political solution, if you will, more government bureaucracy, is that government tends to overpromise and underfund. And so you can look at Medicare, which is going bankrupt in 2018, right. Medicaid, which is bankrupting states across the nation, and yet the solution being proposed in Washington is a, is a third government program building upon Medicaid and Medicare, which are already bankrupting government. So not, they're not ringing a, or waving, we've succeeded at this, we failed at this, and we want to do that too. We want to do more of the same. It doubles down on what is broken. Now that does not make sense to me. 
And I don't think it makes sense to the American people, which is why there's such an outcry. And we were talking about it too, because there are such huge repercussions to this. The health care industry, so to speak, or profession, is almost 20% of our, of our gross national product. 20% of our economy deals with health care. Yes, and, and, and perhaps um, what is more emotional to people, in fact, what is absolutely more emotional to people, it also involves their health. That's right. They're afraid that if you don't do it right, that all of a sudden they may not have access to the life-saving technology that they know helped them or their family member at a certain point. No second chance. No second chance. So there's some folks that say any change is better than what we have now. I can promise you, you can make the current system work. The folks who are getting health care can have it not work as well. And the bottom line is, as I understand it, the folks who do have health coverage, they're, what, 80 percent, 90 percent folks are, are happy with it. Yes. Now, now in fairness, uh, for some folks, it's very expensive. So we have to come up with solutions, which I think are those which are patient-centered, and we can talk about that. We will. We have to come up with solutions that, that, that remove the insecurity of, can I afford my health insurance policy if I'm the woman that gets the breast lump, or I'm the man that suddenly has a heart attack? We need to give security that they'll be able to afford insurance even if something bad happens. Frankly, um, the way I view it is the individuals, those of us who need the health care, we're worried about the quality of the health care. Now, we, cost is an issue. It seems like uh, the government is more concerned about the cost. They want to rein it in, um, and we want to make sure we're willing to pay if we can make sure we've got quality care, and we kind of got a rub between the two. You know, Lock, you can actually achieve the goal of controlling cost if you take care of people's health. Now, the interesting thing is you can approach high cost as, well, let's have cost control by a bureaucracy in Washington, D.C., or you can say, we're going to control costs by encouraging people to make wiser decisions, to live healthier lifestyles, to use their money more wisely, more wisely. that will control costs. And of course, that's the most, I mean, relying on the government to reduce costs with whatever tools they think they're going to use versus an individual, it seems pretty, pretty simple. Uh, it's the difference answer. between a centrally planned economy and an economy where each individual is responsible for their own actions. History tells us that works better than the central. And so your focus, your bottom line is, when it's all said and done, and we'll get to it, the answer is you want to be individual focused Yes. versus government masses focused. Patient-centered, patient's health-centered, patient making the best decisions for her health and her pocketbook, and that will control costs for all. Because they're motivated then. All right, let's, let's talk about, from what I understand, the three basic options that are being discussed. We've got the public option, uh, we have the co-op option, and then we have the maintain the current system with some modification and adjustments, uh, maybe introduce uh, the health savings accounts with more modifications and such. Is that correct? Well, I would, I would um, interestingly, I would say that uh, the last option is not really the status quo. I think the status quo has to change, and so there is reform required. So on your third option, I'd make a stronger statement about the changes that have to So it would be a private focus, but great modification. Yeah. All right. All right. Let's talk about the public option, because initially, as I understand it, it's called H.R. 3200. Uh, mandatory, got to have it. That's the way it is. We're not looking at anything else. So explain to me the the option, the public yeah. option. Uh, in, in fairness to the people that advocate this, they say that because a typical insurance market in a state is dominated by two or three big insurance companies, there's no competition. And so their, their feeling is that you have to come in with a government option in which the government would then um, uh, be the fourth competitor or the third competitor and would give folks a choice between the two. All right, let's keep, continue that discussion on the next segment. This is Locke Merritt with Legal Lines. Dr. Uh, Bill Cassidy, we'll be right back. Everybody loves on-demand from Cox. Well, did you know the love's about to grow? Soon, your on-demand menu will have a whole new look, making it easier than ever to find your favorite shows, access hundreds of movies, and thousands of free programming choices, even HD, just like that, so you can watch what you want to watch when you want to watch it. It just keeps growing better every day. See what's coming on demand and get more out of what you're into with Cox Digital Cable. 
Welcome back to Legal Lines. I'm Locke Meredith, and again, very pleased to have on the show Dr. Bill Cassidy. He is our United States Congressman for District 6 in the state of Louisiana. Again, Bill, thank you so much. Thank you, Locke. Let's get back into it. All right, we were talking about the three options that are being bounced around right now to deal with the health care crisis, if you want to call it that, is the public option, the co-op option, and the private option with great modification to mm -hmm. deal with the issues that, that, that are there that need to be fixed. The public option, discuss it. Again, the, the idea is that there needs to be, in fairness to the people that propose it, competition with private insurance companies. And that's supposed to reduce costs and increase quality or what? Well, the idea is that they, will, according to the people that support this, that it would be so big they could tell hospitals, physicians, and others how much they're going to pay them. So you couldn't negotiate. They would just decide you're going to get paid $100 for this. Now, you may say it cost me $110 but they're going to say we're going to give you a hundred period. I mean in that kind of the way it takes place now the government through Medicare and Medicaid says this is what we're going to pay take it or leave it and and then the health insurance companies come in and they say Dr. Cassidy this is what we're willing to pay do you want to be part of our, our doctor group that, that we pay or not? Well see precisely back up you hit it man the idea is right now Medicaid and Medicare do say what they're going to pay now, if, it charge, if a hospital costs $100 to do something, whatever that is, Medicaid only pays $66 of that $100. Medicare pays about $88 of that $100. So the problem is... They're is sucking wind. They're sucking wind. So somebody has to make that up. So it's the privately insured who are actually paying more to subsidize the government program. In fact, I read that each individual who does have insurance coverage is paying about $1,800 per year more because they're paying for the folks who aren't paying. And, 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 and that, the, That's right? That's right. And who's not paying is Medicaid and Medicare. Now, this is not the Republican Party making this up. This is not Bill and Locke making it up. This is objective data from third parties that are think tanks that look at this sort of thing. So if we come in with a third option that's building upon these two, the fear is it's going to pay 88 cents on the dollar. Right. And that means that those people with private insurance will pay even more. And that means sooner or later they can't afford it, so they'll end up on Medicaid or Medicare or on this third option. So even though the president says you can keep your plan if you want to, the table will be tilted so everybody rolls down to this one. Finally, you end up with a single-payer plan, underpaying, and as it underpays, ultimately services are sacrificed. Well, and I'm... I, I, so we got 47 million folks who are uninsured at this point, and are they going to now just be thrown into the system and the doctors and the current folks that we have in this profession are going to be overwhelmed with providing them care? Well, first, 47 million is a misleading number. Okay. About 10 million of those are, are illegal, and nobody's planning. So they're not Americans. In the sense of being covered under this policy. Okay, because the reason I say that, Bill, is that the House bill says to provide affordable, quality health care for all Americans. Correct. Illegals are not... I mean, Illegals, not, according to the people that are supporting this, and I'm just trying to give it straight, not rhetoric, the people that are supporting this bill say that it would not include illegal aliens. Okay. okay. About 10 to 15 million people already qualify for S-CHIP or Medicaid. Which is, I guess, government subsidized or paid for health care. And they just choose not to sign up. Okay. Now, that's kind of crazy. You bring the horse to water, but you can't make them drink. Okay. And the tragedy is some of those are children and their parent just doesn't. And so their, their health conditions worsen and they come in when it could have prevented at a much lower cost exactly. and now you've got a crisis on your hands. So you can't really blame that. Th that problem we've already addressed. About 10 million people who are uninsured earn $90,000 a year or more but just don't want to pay for it. So they, they're invincible, the immortal well, mentality. Yeah, or they just say, I'd rather spend my money on a new car. And there's about uh, another 10 million who are not wealthy, but they're young males, 18 to 28, and they just don't think any, they're the immortals. Okay. <laughs> so there's about 10 million, uh, if I have my numbers right, but there's about 10 million that we really need to work for. That's the woman, like my wife saw in her, her breast cancer surgery practice, who was 55, her husband, I forget, had divorced or had died. She got a breast lump, she was uninsured, she could not access health care. Uh, now, she could have at her okay long, but let's just say that she felt like she couldn't, and the fact is she couldn't get insurance. And the reason she didn't want to go, I guess, to her okay long, she felt like the quality wasn't as good? Well, a lot of folks, she was uh, in old Goodwood with a nice home. She had never had to access the system. I work at her okay long. I can say that the physicians Quality's and nurses are, are quality and dedicated, 
But sometimes you look at the outside of the building and you're not quite so sure. Right. It's not real pretty. It's when you're inside that you say, wow, thank you for being so kind to me. Having said that, ideally she would have been able to have accessed health insurance and have, could have entered the system through a traditional thing. Because she had a breast lump, there was no way she was getting a, a health insurance. So in reality, we're really not dumping 47 or however many million folks onto the medical profession. In other words, their workload will not increase. Oh, well, the workload will increase somewhat because if somebody suddenly has coverage, I have patients who okay. are working people and who need a liver transplant, for example, don't have coverage, can't get coverage, and so finally when they hit 65 or go on disability, then they do it. Then they do it. So they may get something beforehand. Uh, th by the way, those patients are why it makes it so personal to me. I know life stories of folks whose care was delayed because they didn't have access to coverage, even though they would have liked to have paid for it at whatever price. Interesting. So, so that said. All right. So, so the con with the public system, to summarize, or the public option is what? The con with the public option is that it's going to tilt the table to a government-run program. Government-run programs tend to overpromise and underfund, and ultimately care will be rationed or, 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 or quality will be sacrificed because, again, government overpromises and underfunds, and ultimately you need to adequately fund. Okay, so it would not provide, uh, I guess, quality health care because uh, it would be rationed because you'd have an influx of needs. Yeah, and ultimately, what politician is going to say, I'm going to raise your taxes in order to pay for more care? Well, and that was my next point. The cost, as I understand it, is going to be at least a trillion, if not more, based on the budget office's own numbers. The Congressional Budget Office, the independent arm of Congress, says that the reason that the government option plan and the proposals before Congress are so expensive is there's nothing transformative. That same old broken Medicare and Medicaid systems bankrupting the federal and state governments is the basis for this new plan. That's a government bureaucracy plan. It is not a patient-centered plan. CBO says it's not transformative. That's why it will continue to cost so much. Definition of insanity, doing the same thing and expecting a different result. Yes. Interesting. All right. So shift gears. Let's talk about the, the other option that's being discussed, the co-op. Although you and I were talking about it, I don't really know what that means. No one does. That's why it has so much appeal. It can be whatever you, <laughs> <laughs> it can be whatever you want it to be. Uh, but the co-op has been done in some states like, I think, Wisconsin, where a group of farmers came together and, and whatever profits that they had at the end of the year, i.e. money that they had not spent, went back into the pool and helped lower premiums for the next year. Kind of like workman's comp, if you will. All right. That's actually a model that can work. So if it's strictly on that model, then it may be one of those things that we would like to encourage. But the devil is in the details. And that's what we do not have at this point. Correct. All right, let's further discuss uh, the co-op option on the next segment and then the final option. Okay. This is Lock Merritt of Legal Lines, U.S. Congress, Congressman Bill Cassidy. We'll see you in a minute. Did you know that when you subscribe to a premium channel with Cox, like HBO, you get multiple channels of that premium? And that's not all. Your premium subscription is your ticket to even more entertainment, like entire seasons of your favorite series, plus Hollywood hit movies, all free on demand, ready to watch when you are. Plus, they're available in HD. So enjoy lots more than you asked for with premium channels and Cox Digital Cable. Some people still don't have on-demand from Cox. Impersonators. Who oh, you calling an impersonator, pal? No, 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 no. You insulted him a little bit. A little bit? A little bit. Uh, is there a reason you all aren't using on-demand from Cox? Because I thought you guys would love access to thousands of movies and shows. The stars don't like to watch. No, they're all movies. It's tacky. Mm, did I mention a lot of it's free? Free is hot. <laughs> Boom. On-demand from Cox. Perfect for almost everyone. Welcome back to Legal Lines. I'm Locke Meredith. Again, very pleased to have on the show Dr. Bill Cassidy. He is our United States Congressman for District 6 in the state of Louisiana. Bill, we were talking about, we've talked about the public option and why you're against it. Uh, let's talk about this co-op option, or at least a co-op option that you think might work or has a potential. Mm -hmm. Again, there's a, there's a group of, I think, farmers up in Wisconsin. We heard a presentation on this about four or five months ago, and I kind of like the idea. In Congress? In Congress. Okay. And uh, that's a co-op. And so they came together, pulled enough money to cover insurance costs for everybody at the end of the year. If there was any money left over, it lowered the premiums for the next year. In other words, they made a prepayment, in uh, essence. A prepayment. But it's kind of what you do with insurance. 
Now the idea behind it is if you have profits, you don't distribute it to a group of shareholders or you don't increase the pay of your CEO, but rather you as a group come together and decide we're going to cover these things. We're all farmers. We're all in this together. This is what we'll cover. This is what we not. It's our decision. We live with it. But if there's money we save at the end of the year, we either expand service, lower premiums, or somehow improve now, things. Now, wouldn't there have to be enough folks that would get together that they would be uh, in a position to negotiate with the private insurers? Uh, well, they wouldn't necessarily, they wouldn't have to negotiate with private insurers. They could negotiate directly with physician groups or hospitals. Ah, so they could become interesting. Their own, they could become their own insurance company. So you've got a designated group of uh, endocrinologists or orthopedics, hospitals, et cetera. You go to those guys say, hey, this is how much cheese we got. This is what we're willing to pay in premiums. Will you all provide your services? And effectively, they become an insurance company, but the profits go back to the company to keep premiums lower. The other nice thing is instead of uh, somebody you don't know making a decision as to whether or not this service is covered or that service is covered, it's you and your peers and you and your peers come together and say, we're going to cover this, but not that. Now, how, how would that take care of that 10 million group of folks that you said we need to take care of? The people that are talking about co-ops feel like the basic problem is the lack of competition among insurance companies. And this is a way to, if you will, jumpstart jump the creation of another insurance company. Just leaving them out. Uh, yeah. Then we, we don't need to be paying you money to do your thing. We're going to be the insurance company. Exactly. Now, that may have some role in decreasing administrative cost. Or it may, if you think that insurance companies, the problem is lack of competition, then that may do that. I still am not sure that that gets at the core of the problem. Well, do you believe that there is a lack of competition between the health insurers? There is. A, uh, in some states, there are only two to three, or may, maybe four, companies which have a huge amount of market share. Um, on the other hand, there are ways to create competition, if you will, for the insurance companies that go beyond trying to plot, you know, trying to get another one in there. That said, a way to address this, the re there's a Republican proposal that would allow companies, say in Mississippi, to sell insurance in Louisiana. Right now, Blue Cross Lu Louisiana sells in Louisiana. Blue Cross Mississippi sells in Mississippi. Hmm. Uh, there are proposals that would allow interstate competition and so an insurance company here could sell in Alabama. Are you telling me that, that each individual state is limiting the players that can provide the coverage in the Correct. state? I did not know that. Correct. Because you so, see these, you know, these television commercials and they say, you know, we provide insurance to you. I didn't realize that each state is limiting who can you, provide you, the coverage. Unlike, say, um, uh, well, I'm sure in car insurance there's still some limit, but at the same time it's a much more competitive market and there are more players that are coming and exiting all the time. That's not the case in healthcare. Interesting. All right. What is your recommendation? You've been, like I said, on the front lines. What would you do to fix this? Well, uh, you have to first look at what is driving cost. There is an article from, uh, I think, Macmillan Quarterly, and they talk about the three things you got to change. You got to make it so that people know what they're buying at the price they're buying. You have to increase transparency. And care. Because if they don't benefit from reducing the cost, yeah, it's not going to fix anything. Yeah, you, you have to give them skin in the game, if you will. You've got to decrease the administrative cost. So 40% of what a family practitioner uh, has in her practice is billing administration. That We talked about that. Right. You've got to decrease that administrative cost. Uh, and lastly, you've got to address lifestyle. So our, uh, there's one article that suggests that the entirety of our increased cost is related to the obesity epidemic. And as people get heavier, more than they should, they need more uh, bypass operations. They have higher problems with cholesterol and stroke and knee replacements. And that is all related to being too heavy. So we've also got to, and smoking of course, we don't sure. need to talk about. So you have to address those lifestyle changes. So transparency, administrative cost, and lifestyle changes. So what does that look like? I mean, what, what bills are pending or that y'all are contemplating mm -hmm. uh, that I guess address those issues. Okay, so all three can be addressed in what I call patient-centered health care. Now I think that the uh, uh, proposal that's before Congress, H.R. 3200, is a bureaucratic centered health care. But, but patient-centered would say, uh, let me give some examples. Uh, the Safeway is a large grocery chain across the nation, although not in Louisiana. They, for their employees, will decrease the premium if the employee engages in a smoking cessation program or a diet program or a um, exercise program. So they don't increase your premiums if you don't, 
they decrease your premiums if you do. So you have incentives, skin in the game. Skin in the game. And they have found that by doing this, patients lose weight. They stop smoking. And as they do so, Safeway's healthcare costs have remained flat. Remember we spoke, you can either approach it by controlling cost or by improving health. By improving health, they've controlled cost. So uh, John Fleming is a congressman from Shreveport. Uh, he, their group went.